Welcome back to Floss Law. All right, we're on video number five, 10 days for the next 10 years. 10 videos over 10 days to help you become a real estate investor. So 10 years from now, when this next decade is done, you'll be a successful real estate investor. Um, before we get into it, um, thanks for coming back. Um, we just finished the two to four unit video. Um, hopefully you follow that over into this one. Um, if you're on YouTube, if you can hit subscribe, um, thumbs up, any comments you have. And then if you're watching on any of the other platforms on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, just uh, follow along, add me, um, and then you'll get the videos every day. Um, and after these 10 videos are done, uh, we're going to keep doing uh, more regular updates to the video, not every day, but we're going to do them. I'm going to try to commit to doing them at least once or twice a week um, so we can keep this going on a regular basis. There's still a lot of information we need to cover um, for, for all those newer investors out there, or just investors who are looking to scale up. So today's video is multifamily. We're talking about buying your first multifamily building. You might be a new investor and you want to make the jump for your first building to be multifamily, or you might be an investor that's done a couple condos, a couple single family, maybe a couple two flats. Now you want to jump up, you want to scale up to get your first multifamily property. Um, this is going to be a primer for learning about multifamily. Um, we're going to gloss over a lot of different topics. We're not going to have time to get in depth on everything. We'd be here the whole day. Um, and there's football on. I like football. No, I'm just kidding. There, there's just there's so much we're going to have to cover. There's so many topics we're going to have to cover with this. Um, multifamily is not easy to get into. Um, there's a learning curve with it, and that's why a lot of people struggle with getting their first multifamily property because there's a lot you need to learn. It's different from residential real estate. It's different from other parts of real estate. Um, there's a lot you need to learn about multifamily to get your first property. And even once you get into it, there's still a lot you need to learn. Multifamily is just a whole different animal. Um, multifamily um, is defined as five units and up. Typically, we don't get many five units. Typically, it's like a six unit, then an eight unit, then it jumps up to 12, then 18, then 24, and those those kind of increments is what we normally see. Um, so there, there's a lot you need to um, learn about. This is, this is the start. If this is a college course, this will be um, learning about apartments 101 um, and then they would keep going on from there so this this is your step one to learning about it but if you really want to get involved with buying a multifamily building you need to make the commitment to reading about it learning about it um, talking to people about it because there's gonna be a lot of things you're gonna to need to know about um, I personally, some people may disagree. If you disagree, put it in the comments below. But I personally believe um, it could making a bad apartment investment um, might be the second riskiest thing you can do. Um, the most risky thing, obviously, is if you do um, a, a bad fix and flip property. So if you buy a property, it goes over budget. Um, you know the appraised value doesn't come out on the rehab. You know at the after rehab value. Um, you know you have to come out of pocket on closing. I've had people do that. Um, when they have just a rehab go sideways that's the most riskiest um, there's a lot of profit to be made when you do fix and flips but if they go bad um, there's a lot of risk associated with that too probably the second riskiest thing would be um, making a bad buy in an apartment building so if you make a bad buy in an apartment building you know if you make a bad buy in a house um, say you buy a house and, and you miss that it needed a new roof or you know the hot water heater blows or something happens um, at least you're living in it I mean, you have to do work to fix up the house, but at least you're getting value out of living in the property, you're getting something from it. Um, when you buy a bad multifamily building, you're just bleeding out cash every month because it's supposed to be for income. It's supposed to be an investment. And if the investment part doesn't work, then you just are holding this asset that's just you're losing money every single month on. Um, and, and that could be crippling for a new investor. There's some people, they buy one building, the building just goes bad, and they never buy anything ever again. Um, and, and I hate to see that. So I want to make sure you know um, when you're looking at multifamily, what you need to do to limit as much risk as possible. Um, one of the biggest things I coach investors on when you're looking at multifamily is creating, creating a value for your risk. 
because every investment has risk. But when you're buying an apartment building, we need to place values upon that risk to make sure that if things should go wrong, um, you're protected, you made a good investment. So um, a lot of times when we're, we're going through a lot of these things, I'm going to be talking about placing a value upon the risk for that property. Um, if you do risk valuation on properties, you protect yourself from being um, put in a position where you have a bad property. So what are some of the, the things that we put risk value on? Well. Um, risk valuation can be um, if a property um, is just located in a really bad neighborhood, there's a lot of crime. Um, risk valuation can be if a building has just a, a history of poor rental performance. Um, risk valuation could be if there's a lot of evictions. Risk valuation could be um, if there's just a poor tenant pool in a particular area. Um, risk valuation could be um, any number of those things. If, if there's a lot of deferred maintenance on a property and you're going to have to do um, um, a bunch of work in the future to it um, you know if we uh, risk valuation can we put a value on if there's an old boiler in the basement we need to rip that boiler out things like that so you're placing values on all those things now the easiest thing is to place value on the physical repairs needed to the property the the thing that people sometimes miss is placing values on um, the external or environmental factors of the building so um, at this point, let's let's. I, I'm gonna do a whole separate thing on cap on cap rate because it, that takes a long time to um, really talk about in depth. Um, so I don't want to get distracted and get off on a tangent because I want to focus focus this on buying multifamily, not on on you know values of multifamily. But I want you to know that um, you need to do research on cap rate. So cap rate is how you determine the value of a property. Um, the cap rate reflects taking the the um, uh, the gross for a property, the gross rent coming in, subtract out the expenses, so you get the net. And you take that net, and then the cap is your multiplier for determining the value of a property. So the the um, the cap directly reflects what the seller believes the property is worth. So the cap directly correlates to the asking price of the property. So um, sometimes I don't even, you know, when, you see, when you see advertisements for a commercial property, you don't even necessarily see the asking price. It'll just say what the cap is because the cap is really determining um, what the valuation of that asset is, what the valuation of the property is. And sometimes we eliminate properties not even because of the purchase price. Sometimes we eliminate properties just because because we're, we're not comfortable with the, the cap rate determined in that area. So it's your job, one of, one of the biggest things with an investor is knowing a particular neighborhood. So you need to know an area, you need to know a neighborhood, you need to do your research. Um, I don't like it when I see investors that are trying to look at too many properties, you know, all in different states all over the country. Um, because in order to know if you the cap rate or the, the you know, that multiplier of that property is reflective of the neighborhood, you need to really have done your research on that particular area of that pocket. Um, in Chicago, we have you know, I'm, there's like hundreds of pockets in Chicago. It's obnoxious sometimes. There's certain areas where um, a pocket could be a block, and then the next block is terrible, and the next block is great, and then the next block is terrible, and the next block is break is great again. Um, it, it's it's hard sometimes, um, and you'll see people that are really frustrated trying to invest in Chicago because um, they try to. Um, do um, analytical research on like a zip code, but the, you know, there could be seven different pockets within that zip code. So they're taking a bad pocket with a good pocket and, and aggregating them together. Um, and they're not really getting a good sense for uh, a neighborhood. And that's where you get, end up with people who make bad purchases because um, they don't, they don't take the time to understand that. They don't take the time to understand you need to have people on the ground telling you of, you know, this side of the, this side of the street's good and that side of the street's bad. Bad. I mean, it really comes down to that sometimes. So you need to take time to do that research. Part of it is also um, you can't accurately incorporate those external environmental factors um, if you don't know the neighborhood. So um, we get people who will overpay for property because they're not familiar with the neighborhood. So there, there's neighborhoods where they just have a history of, you know, it, it's not necessarily a, a dangerous neighborhood. Everyone's really hung up on the crime um, aspect of it. 
and there's areas that are not heavy crime necessarily, but they just have a history of really poor rental performance. And certain people know that and certain people don't. So you may have a building in a neighborhood and they're saying, hey, this is a nine cap. And if you're an investor coming from another part of the country and you're thinking, well, it has great, the numbers look great and I love it that it's a nine cap, so I wanna go ahead and buy it. But what they don't realize is that it has a history of poor rental performance. So you're, if the property manager has to go back every week to try to collect rent from people and you're always chasing the tenants for rent, it's gonna drive up your management costs and your expenses are gonna be high and it's gonna drive down the profit for the building. So they may have said it was a nine cap um, if everyone's paying their rent, but they're not paying their rent or you know it's, it's a pain in the butt managing this building. So by the time you get done at the end of the year, it really performs like maybe a seven or a six cap. And if you had known that, you wouldn't have bought the building. So what happens is you you think it's great as a nine cap, but me knowing that neighborhood would know, well, I wouldn't pay anything below a 12 cap because that, that area has problems. So that's really like a 12 cap zone for me. I'm not willing to do a nine cap on that. Um, and, and sometimes we deal with some um, differing of opinions when you have a neighborhood that maybe is going from a D neighborhood to a C neighborhood, meaning, um, so like A is a fantastic neighborhood where there's no issues. B would be a neighborhood where it's, you know, it's solid. Um, C is, you know, may, might have some evictions, you might have some issues. And D is just, it's a, it's a disaster. Um, so sometimes people will take a building that either the building itself or the neighborhood it's in is a D um, and try to push it up to a C, you know, trying to stabilize the rent a little bit, trying to stabilize the tenant in the neighborhood. Um, but if you don't know that, you think it's a C, the realtor's telling you it's a C, everyone's telling you it's a C, you buy this thing and you find out it's a D. Um, and unfortunately, that can happen quite often. It's where you see people get stuck with a bad investment because um, people have overvalued the property. From afar, it looks good. But if you talk to someone who is familiar with that neighborhood, they would have told you that's that's not, you know, a nine cap's not good enough for there. A nine cap a half a mile down the road is great, but a nine cap here is not going to work. Um, so you need to know that you need to do research. Part of that is networking. So if you're going to get involved with multifamily commercial real estate, you need to spend a lot of time networking with agents. So um, for a lot of different reasons. Number one, the agents will tell you that kind of stuff. So if you're talking to them all, they'll kind of give you an idea of what pricing is supposed to be in particular areas. Also, because if you're not talking to the agents, most commercial real estate is done off market. So um, uh, one of the biggest things I have to stop people on is they'll, they'll call me and say, you know, I'm trying to buy multifamily, but I'm not seeing anything. And I have to say, well, or, or there's no good properties out there. And, and usually my first response is, well, well, how are you finding them then? What do you, what do you, what's your method of finding them? If you tell me that you're looking for multifamily and you've just been looking on like Zillow or MLS, well, that's why you haven't bought a multifamily because they're, they're, you're, you're not going to find them there. Most multifamily doesn't go on those avenues anyway. Um, and the the ones that are there aren't, aren't the really good ones anyway. Um, then you have to get on the on where the commercial agents go, which is you'll see a lot of them posting on LoopNet, you'll see a lot of them posting on, um, uh, I call it Crexi, I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce it, C-R-E-X-I. Um, they usually use one of those two um, websites and you can find a lot of commercial properties on there. But I usually tell people, go to those websites, get the names of the commercial agents on there that are dealing with the neighborhoods or the type of buildings you want to have and reach out to them directly. Because a lot of really, really good assets are sold completely off market over text message and phone call and email. Um, sometimes a couple, a couple phone calls and an email and we have a property sold um, because Commercial agents know who the other people are that have bought stuff before. So if they get a really hot property, they get a property that, you know, the valuation is great. The seller has realistic, you know, numbers in mind as far as what they want to get for the property. They know they can move this thing. This is going to be a really, really good asset for somebody. Um, just think yourself logically here are they going to want to work with a new person who hasn't bought anything before that you know they may or may not get the financing for it or are they going to want to work with someone that's already bought properties that they know either has cash or can get financing and will close on it 
they're going to want to go back to the people that they already know can close because they want to go with the sure thing. So when those really good assets come up, they're going to go to their network of people that they know that they've either already sold properties to or they've met that they know are successful investors and say, look, you already bought the, the two buildings around the corner. Do you want to add this one to you? You already have everything, your management company, everything's in place. Do you want to add this to the portfolio? Sure. And we, you know, we get those deals done really fast. Um, so you need to be uh, competing with that. Uh, if you're not doing at least talking to the agents, you're not even in the game. You're not even in the ballpark. So number one is you need to reach out to the agents, just talk to them. Let them know you're interested in being an investor. Be clear about what you're trying to buy. You can't tell them that, you know, I'm looking at um, the rental condos, but I kind of like two flats, but I really want to buy a multifamily. Well, they don't, they're not going to take you serious because you're not taking yourself serious. If you want to be by multifamily, you need to be focused on multifamily. You're not screwing around with all that other stuff. You need to be focused on being a multifamily investor. So you need to be focused on doing that. Um, know exactly how many number of units you want. You know, usually people um, will say, you know, I want to get involved in multifamily, but I want to get like a six to eight unit, or they bought a couple of six to eight units and they say, all right, now I want, now I want an 18 unit building. I want to take the step up to one bigger. Um, you know, the big guys will say, don't send me anything that's under a hundred units. You know, that's, that's on a whole different level, but um, you need to be clear about what neighborhood you want to be in, what type of asset you want, and even, you know, the, the number of units you're looking for the building you want to add. And, and you, they're going to want to um, qualify you as well. Do you have cash on hand? Do you have financing? Um, you know, what's your ability to close on it? Once they've done all that, then you're going to be within their sphere of influence where um, when they get a really good property, they're going to send it to you and say, oh, hey, I just got this. Um, why don't you take a look at it? Let me know if you're interested in it. <clears throat> Part of it is too, you gotta to remember the agent mindset. So I do training for agents, explain to them how to do commercial deals. When you're putting your house up for sale, your agent wants to get 100 people through your house so they can find the one buyer. Um, when you're dealing with an apartment building, your agent wants to find 100 people qualify them, find one person who can buy it and take that one person through the building. Because showing commercial property is not easy. Um, it, it's a very difficult thing to do. You're arranging for tenants to let you into their home. A lot of times the tenants don't want to. Um, it can be a difficult prospect. So it's not uncommon for commercial agents, if you reach out to them, might give you a day. Say, listen, Tuesday at 10 o'clock is the window. Anyone that's interested in buying this, I'm going to be there Tuesday from 10 to 11. That's when I notified the tenants that I'm coming through the building. That's when we're going to have the ability to get through there. So you either need to get your butt there or you know, you're not going to be able to buy the building. So, um, you know, be prepared for that that type of thing too. You know, the, the, we have to make arrangements for the tenants. You know, half the times the tenants don't even open up the door after we've notified them about it. So, you know, even that makes it more difficult. Um, so showing these properties is, is a big task. Don't, don't discount that um, and and they want to make sure that if they take the time to go through all of that to make all those arrangements that you're serious about buying the building they don't want to waste their time on tire kickers um, for multifamily there's just no room for that there's no time for that we don't have time for that um, so you need to take it serious and you need to be ready for, um, you need to communicate to them that you're ready to do this and you want to be taken seriously so that you're getting um, at least in the running for getting those good properties. Because, um, you know, the really good ones, you know, we, I get them in my email, um, you know, all the time where, you know, it, no one even knew that the building was for sale. It's just they put two people together and that's it. The deal's done. All right. So when we're looking at properties, there's a couple of th different things you need to know. So you you found the property. So we did all that. You talked to the agents. We'll talk about more of that another day. So you talk to the agent. You find a building you like. You put an offer in on it. You determine what um, cap rate is good for that neighborhood. Um, determine that you got a good value for it. You think everything is good. You get it under contract. You send it to me. Now we start the attorney review process. Now when I'm doing the attorney review for um, a house or condo or whatever, um, there's a set rate I have for that. Um, I usually charge more for doing an apartment building because the process is different and the attorney review is a little bit more intense so when you did your house if most of you bought a house you know we go through the contract together you get a home inspection done we go through the home inspection together we ask for credits blah 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 when we're doing a building um 
we're going to go through, obviously we're going to look at the contract, go do the contract review. You're going to get a home inspection. The home inspector is going to go through, um, tell you if he needs a new roof or a boiler or anything like that. So we got all that. But we're doing a building. Um, we're going to really pour over those income and those expenses. So it's it's really crucial that um, don't take that for granted. Um, that you know, and and I want to be careful that I don't put anyone on on blast here. But um, it's really really common in commercial uh, in in buying apartment buildings that the income and the expenses are inaccurate. Um, I don't want to accuse anyone of lying, but it's sometimes the numbers are not represented correctly. Um, that could be for a lot of different things. It could be they just plain forgot something. Um, it could be that a lot of times you're dealing with um, real estate groups where there's a lot of people involved and things just get missed, um, or someone did something incorrectly. They you know they told their assistant to do it and their assistant just screwed it up or whatever the case may be. Um, we want to pour over that. I get a lot of deals where um, either the income or the expenses have been misrepresented. Um, you can misrepresent the income by failing to disclose that um, some of the tenants haven't been paying. So they'll just make it look like all the tenants are paying every month when in fact they have not. Um, they may not accurately reflect that. Um, here's what the rent correction has been for the last 12 months, but fail to disclose to you that four of them moved out yesterday. Um, or what else have I had? I had I had a, a deal a couple of years ago where um, the agent had been told by the seller that um, all the tenants paid their own heat. But when we did the started the attorney review, um, the agent had given us bad information, and it turned out that there was a forty thousand dollar year gas bill on the property that the seller was paying when we asked for the itemized expenses for the building. Obviously adding a $40,000 expense on, on, on the, um, the yearly expense for the building made a huge difference to the net. So my buyer was like, I don't, I don't like this deal anymore. So we ended up having to unfortunately cancel that deal. Um, we tried to lower the price to reflect that line item on there, but the seller wasn't willing to. So it was kind of a weird situation. Um, and he knew it, but you know, stuff like that happens. Um, I've, I had some situations where, Clients might ask me to come in and help them. You know, they may already have something under contract, and um, you know, sometimes people forget. I get a lot with investors um, where they just kind of forget. You know, they have so much going on. You know, they they send me the contract for a property that they got under contract a month ago. You know, in, in a turn review and everything's already passed, and they're just like, I, I just totally forgot to even send this to you. And I'm like, oh well, there's not a whole lot I can do now. Um, and we walk into closing. And, and we run into situations where um, the same kind of thing, like three of the tenants haven't been, it turns out three of the tenants haven't been paid rent in four months and have to be evicted and they just didn't tell the buyer or they haven't paid or there's, you know, pending evictions that they didn't tell the buyer about. Um, or, you know, the one, the one I, I had a whole stretch where I had a bunch of properties in a row where we got to closing. They're you know, like, oh yeah, one N and three S. Uh, moved out yesterday. Sorry, and you know they don't say that until after the closing's done. We can eliminate those things at the very beginning, at the during the attorney review process, by going through and saying, you know, we need to review the leases. What are the end dates of the leases? And reviewing that and say, well, did this person renew? Did they not renew? Are they month to month now? What's the deal there? Um, and really going over those income and expenses. So we want to eliminate that. Um, if you if you don't do that, I see a lot of investors um, skip that kind of thing. Um, buy the building themselves. They they think that they're they can do it on their own, um, and everything looks good until they start onboarding onboarding is the process where you're now the new owner of the property you need to communicate to all the tenants that pay the rent to you and get everything kind of all set up for you know whatever your account is for that building and that type of thing when you're doing that onboarding process is when they find out that there's a bunch of things wrong people behind on rent whatever the case may be um, so the sometimes they don't find out until then when we could have found that at the beginning of the process and either adjusted the price or done whatever so, which leads right into the next thing. Um, I'm a big believer in 
um, uh, a, a couple different things. Number one, I want you to stop worrying about if a building is pretty or ugly. I don't care if a building's ugly. Um, when we're looking at income property, all we care about is cash flow. So if it's ugly, it looks funny, um, the layout's odd, if it's a weird color, um, the it just it, it looks stupid, whatever. I get weird comments like that. Look, is it cash flowing? You're not living there. It's not your house. It's a building. If people like it and they're living there and they're paying rent, I don't care if it looks like you know the cat in the hat's house. Who cares? Is, you know, we get weird looking buildings all the time. Um, that cash flow amazing, and sometimes we can get really good prices for those because. People, investors drive by and go, well, it looks funny. Look, is it cash flowing or not? That's all I care about. Which also leads into determining value on your risk. So I'm a, I'm a big, big proponent. One of the biggest things I, I try to get through to investors is always placing a value upon your risk on a property. So um, placing a value on if a neighborhood has poor rental performance. That's where that ca we go back to that cap rate. Um, you know, if a building is, they're asking a nine cap for it, but you know that you placed a certain value on the poor rental performance of a neighborhood, um, you know, kind of a high crime in the neighborhood, all that kind of stuff. You're placing that value on it and you're saying, you know, you're asking a nine cap for it, but I need to be at like an 11 cap to make it work for me because I know values that I've placed on the property. You're, you're putting risk valuations on that property. So risk valuations are all the things we're talking about. Um, if you think you're not going to be able to get rental performance, if you're going to have a lot of evictions, if, if the building looks like it's needing a new roof and it might need new porches, um, all, all those different factors involved, you're placing your risk valuations on that property and you're determining what you think you should be paying for that property. Um, so, and that's how you can keep yourself from making those bad investments. Um, a, a lot of times our negotiations come down to that. Um, a lot, you know, we don't even necessarily, um, obviously we're gonna adjust the price in negotiations, but usually the price is a reflection of us talking about the cap rate. So when we're going back and forth and determining the buying a property or not, you know, we'll say, you know, whether it's a mil or two million or three million or however much the property is, usually we'll correlate to that cap. We'll say, you know, at a, at a you know, at three million, this is a six and a half cap. Um, it doesn't really work at that valuation for it. For us, we really need to get it down to like a seven cap, which puts us down at about um, 2.9 million. So really the max we're gonna pay for this property, or we can offer for this property is 2.9 million. Um, to be honest, we'd really be more comfortable if we're at an eight cap. And you, so we're correlating those two numbers with each other. That's a lot, a, a lot of our negotiations come down to that because the cap rate is your reflection of um, what you determined the value for this property should be. We use that a ton. Um, so get familiar with using cap rate a lot. You'll see some people that will emphasize cash on cash return. Cash on cash return is um, how quickly you're getting your money back that you actually put into the property out of your own pocket. So you're taking your down payment. You're not worrying about so much the financing end of it. Um, you're taking your down payment money. So say you put a hundred thousand, a million, whatever your down payment is. Um, and if you can get a cash on cash return where, um, let's say, let's just make up a number. Let's say you put um, $500,000 down on a building, but the building is going to net you a hundred grand a year. So the cash on cash return, you're gonna get your money back in five years they'll say look you're gonna the money you're out of pocket for you but in five years you're gonna have that money back so and, you know this should be a great investment um, I like cash on cash return I, I like it secondary though I like to know cap rate first I want to know that a building overarching um, is going to cash flow positively at, at the rate that I want it to be at determining when factoring in all the risks involved with it. And then if it has good cash on cash return, that's sort of the icing on the cake. Um, but I don't like, some people say do cash on cash return, don't worry so much about cap rate. Um, but I want to know that it's a it's a, going to be a viable long-term asset. If you have a low cap rate, that means that your net you're making on that property is really low. So you're getting your money back, but it's not really profitable. So the, the property is not profitable. If stuff starts breaking or you get some evictions, um, it's not going to perform. You know, you, you might be breaking even on it. So I don't, I don't necessarily like that so much. Um, 
I think you can make a bad investment look good by overemphasizing cash on cash return. Whereas, you know, cap rate, cap rate is cap rate. Um, you just have to be able to know what are the factors in the cap rate. So you don't think it looks good as a nine cap, and it turns out you should have been paying a 12 cap for it. If, that, if you're following along with this. And we're going to have to, like I said, this is a primer. Um, I know I might be talking about this really fast and you're thinking, I still don't understand cap rate. We'll come back to it at a later date. Um, but this this is, at least you now you're making notes and you're understanding what you need to learn more about. All right. So I, I know we're, we're going over a lot, but we're already a half hour in, and this 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 is a big topic. We're gonna, um, I could spend an hour just doing cap rate, and I might have to later do an hour just on cap rate so that you understand um, how to communicate on that kind of stuff. Um, all right, so we're to cover going over the expenses, um, determining what your value is. Uh, we're trying to, we're trying to, you know, and, and the biggest thing here is we're trying to limit um, by placing a value on all the risks that are involved. We're trying to lower your risk as much as possible. Um, and one of the, you know, obviously when you get involved with real estate investment, you want to make money, and the emphasis is on make mo making money in cash flow. Um, Remember, I'm the attorney. I'm not. I'm not um, looking at this. I'm not talking to you as the real estate agent. I'm not talking to you as the investor, the guru. I'm the real estate attorney. My job is to try to limit your risk as much as possible. I'm. I'm the. You know, unfortunately, a lot of times the attorneys get a bad rap. Um, I'm kind of the Debbie Downer of the process. I'll be honest. So um, I know what I am. I'm. You know, everyone's all excited, and then they bring it to my desk, and I have to sit down and explain to you everything that's wrong. Um, so that, you know, that's my role here. My role is to make sure that you don't make a bad investment. You don't lose all your money, or you know, do one real estate deal, and you're never going to do a real estate deal again. I want you to do one real estate deal, then do two next year, and then do three the year after that, and keep scaling up. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to help you out with that. Part of my role is helping you determine the risk valuation on there. So you can take the worst property in the world, um, but it could still potentially have value if we get the value that we want for it and we've accurately priced in the risk for it. The only time you make a really bad investment with a property is when you have really haven't accurately um, reflected your risk in the property, determined that value and priced it in and you overpaid for it. As long as we pay for what it's, we believe it's worth and you know that going in and you're prepared for that, I don't really see how you're going to make a bad investment. You just need to be informed and be properly um, compensated for the risk that you're taking on in that property. I've always, always had that from day one. Um, and I've had clients make a lot of money in C and D and even in F neighborhoods. But you need to know that going in. I don't want you thinking that you're buying in a C and you're buying in a D or an F neighborhood. An F neighborhood is like, it's just a complete design. Disaster. It's just you, you're, the building's a disaster. It probably needs to get torn down, and the neighborhood's a disaster. There, there real, there are F properties out there. Believe me, I've dealt with them. Um, generally, we don't want to deal with F. We want to at least at a minimum keep a D. Usually, a D if you do it right, you can push it up to a C. Um, so we want to deal with those type of properties. You can make a lot of money off those properties, but you don't want to think that you're dealing with a C when you're really dealing with the D. Um, and you know, we want to make sure that you're not um, overpaying for those properties. You know, when you're when you're looking at a D property, we want to know that we're looking at a D property and value it as a D property, and then you know, go in and see if we can get it performing and get it up to a C class property where you've created value there. Um, those are the two main. Uh, uh, real fast. Those are the two main um, concepts you should always know when you're talking to a commercial agent too. Buildings really fall into two categories. They're either a value add or they're stabilized. A value add property means a property where um, you can create value either from fixing up the property and raising rents or just raising rents, um, eliminating expenses, or by um, you know trying to find inefficiencies with mismanagement or anything like that, or just you self-managing, you can create value on a property. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, you can. There, I know investors who you know. Obviously, there's investors who make money by finding those big vacant multifamily buildings. Going in, you do the giant gut rehab to them, you rent them out, and then they perform great. When you're doing all the work yourself, you get them for a premium when you're doing that. 
The problem is that's few and far between because doing a gut rehab to an apartment building is way more expensive than you think it is. The reason you see so many of those properties out there is doing a multifamily rehab is not a small endeavor. Um, it usually is whatever budget you think you have for rehabbing multifamily, when you actually find out what the hard costs are for doing it, um, will blow your mind how much money it is because there's just so much more involved than you think is going to be. And there's, it's way more expensive than you think it was going to be. So not a lot of people do that. A lot of people, uh, most investors that I encounter are going through and maybe the um, it needs a cosmetic rehab, meaning the units need to get spruced up. They throw some granite in the kitchens. They make it look nicer. They, they sand the hardwood floors, refinish them, do that type of thing. Um, then you also get um, investors that really, really specialize in it. So I would compare it to like a, a corporate landscape where you have uh, people who invest in corporations and they're really their whole thing is eliminating inefficiencies, eliminating expenses, um, any redundancies and, and streamlining the profit. You can do the same thing with uh, multifamily too. You can find multifamily buildings that are just run very poorly. Um, so, it, and that, that goes through, goes back to when we're really pouring over the income and expenses. Sometimes we'll look at properties and determine, you know, we got this for an eight cap and it's a good building but i think we can really push this up to a nine or a ten cap because this thing is just run really bad um the management company is just bleeding out money um they're spending way too much on you know doing routine maintenance to the building um maybe the utility expenses are out of control you know sometimes we determine a building we need to spend the money to replace the boiler in the building because the old you know sometimes we get boilers that are like from world war ii i swear in these buildings and they're so old they're just the um, the expenses are insane to try to run those old boilers. So sometimes it, we really just go in, replace that boiler, put it in, and it cuts down you know the the fuel expenses for the property like in half. Sometimes you can do things like that, where you're out of pocket for 2020. Maybe you're going to break even for the building, but then 2021 and going beyond, you've greatly increase the profit which then reflects the value of the building so now the value of the building shot up you created that value in the property um, so you can do things like that you can do capital expense we call that a capital expenditure to improve the property but you can also we you know we get buildings where either the owner gets burnt out or they hired a really bad property management company and if you have a bad property management company the building can go to hell in a hurry. I mean, it, it really, it you'd be shocked that if you have a bad property management company in place, how quickly the culture of the tenants with a building can just go completely in the toilet of just, you can take a well-performing building, you can, you can easily take a C-plus property and mismanage it down to a D property a lot faster than you think that you can. So by not answering tenant calls, not doing repairs, um, not getting in there, you know, something's leaking, the water's going everywhere, everything's going to hell. Um, you know, the, so then the tenants stop paying rent. They know that you're not doing anything. You're not paying attention. So why are they paying you rent if you're not paying attention? And now the building has just completely fallen into disrepair. Um, the person owning that property is at a disadvantage. The person buying that property has an opportunity because now that seller is desperate. They're in a really bad situation. They probably just want to walk away from the property like, screw this. This is so messed up. I just need to get out of this building because this has caused such a problem. So now a new person can come in and make a very aggressive purchase on that building and say, you know, there's a lot of building issues with this building. I'm, I'm, I need to buy for a nine cap. And you could go in, do the repairs, get everything settled down with the tenant, maybe push it up to like a, a you know a ten cap or something like that. So you can do that. There's people who really they specialize in that niche of finding either um, retirees or people who just got saddled up with bad property management companies, um, and now you can come in and stabilize the building and create value by doing that. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can do as an investor. You there, I know people who have never swung a hammer. Or, or done anything in a building, but they can create 
um, tremendous amounts of value on the property by um, managing it properly and getting things streamlined and getting the expenses down on the property. Um, you can you can really make a niche for yourself doing that. Now that's going to take time. That's going to take experience. So off the bat, you're not going to be able to necessarily do that. Um, but you can find buildings where there is mismanagement. You can do that type of thing. Um, the, I mean, the most of my advice if you find those buildings where you need to do a little cosmetic work to the units, you can spruce them up, boost up those rents. That's that's generally the best kind of unit you're going to get, or best kind of type of building you're going to get. Um, all right, so we're covering when you're doing your uh, inspection for a building, you may you may or may not want to get a, an inspector who specializes in buildings. There are some property inspectors that only do multifamily buildings. The reason being, you're not going to waste a ton of time in individual units. So that when you're doing like an inspection of a house, they're going to go through, make sure all the faucets look good. They're going to pour over all the individual things in the house. Um, but then maybe they'll spend an hour in the house and we'll kind of look at the roof and go, yeah, I think the roof looks good. It's, it's the flip in multifamily. So um, when, when we do an inspection of a building, you may run through the units and only spend and, and you want to get in every single unit. Very, very important. Always make sure you always get in every, every single unit. Anytime I've ever had a property where they said, well, you know, this tenant's being a problem, but, you know, there's 12 units and you got in 10 of them. And these last two, they look the same as the other ones. Um, I've seen people get burned on that where it turned out those last two units were a disaster zone and needed a gut rehab. So um, don't fall for that trick. If you're buying a building, you get into every single unit in the building for sure. Um, when your inspector is going through, he may only spend a minute in each unit because if you, especially if you know you're going to already do cosmetic upgrades to the unit, you know you don't you don't need to know if the if the drawers in the kitchen you know aren't lined up right or aren't working right or you know maybe there's a leaky faucet. You're going to replace all that anyway. You don't care. So this, this, you just need to make sure that you know. There's no, there's nothing looks like there was any leaks on the ceiling from the unit above. Um, there's no mold or anything anywhere. None of the windows have broken seals or any problems like that. Were you losing, um, you know, utilities from, you know, leaks in the or, um, uh, drafty windows, that type of thing. Um, you're just trying to do like the basic, um, really the capital expenditures within the unit itself, like the windows, the lintels, um, make sure it doesn't look like there's any leaks or anything like that or leaks within the unit, um, or the plumbing or anything like that. Um, you're just going through and doing stuff like that, but you're not going to spend a ton of time in each individual unit. What you really want to do is make sure the inspector is spending a ton of time on the capital expenditure. So um, make sure, is there any place that looked like um, they did tuck pointing and it wasn't done right or we need to do tuck pointing? The exterior windows, the lintels, any work have to be done up there because that gets expensive. Um, make sure they're getting up on the roof and fully inspecting the roof because that could kill your profit for a year. You have to do a roof tear off, so make sure they're really inspecting that well. Um, is everything with the foundation good? How's the boiler? How are the hot water heaters? Those are the things we're, we care about. Um, we don't care if the units look pretty or not. As long as someone's renting it and they're paying money for it, great. All I care about is what are the things I'm going to have to spend money on in this building? Are those good? Or are they not good? I need to know that. If not, if it's got the you know the old octopus boiler, I need a credit because I need to pull that out and I need to replace that. Um, so that those are the negotiations we're doing with the with the property inspection. So make sure you have the right kind of inspector. If you get an inspector and they're spending a half hour in each individual unit. That's, uh, you, we don't care that much about the individual units. It's not that big of a deal. Maybe if you have a building where there's a failed condo and each unit has its own electrical and hot water heater and furnace and plumbing, then, well, obviously it's going to have its own plumbing, um, its own um, HVAC and all that kind of stuff. Um, maybe you want to spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes making sure, you know, the breaker box and all that stuff is good, but we're still not going to spend a ton of time in each unit. We're kind of running through pretty quickly to make sure, just make sure everything's good. Just make sure it's good enough that someone's going to want to rent it. We want to make sure that you get the inspector up on the roof. I want to know the roof's good. I want to know the foundation's good. I want to know, is there any big ticket I am, I'm going to have to fix when I buy this building? So make sure you have um, your inspector has the right frame mind, uh, frame of mind for what you're trying to do, and you're not there for six hours while they're trying to inspect every single nook or cranny of the building. It's not what we're trying to do here. It's an it's an investment. You're not living there. Um, we already talked about talking to agents. Uh, we talked about the cap rate. Um, all right. 
I, I got to be the Debbie Downer again for a minute here. So, uh, uh, sorry. I want you to buy multifamily, but I want you to know the realities of multifamily. When you become a multifamily owner, so you've made you made the jump. You are now a real estate investor, not just a real estate investor. You are a apartment building real estate investor, which is a big jump. That's a big thing. It's a it's you should be proud of that. That is a that is a big deal that not a lot of people get to do. Um, and you have made a big step towards building wealth for you and your family over the long term. When you become a multifamily investor, no one feels sorry for you because you're now the person who is investing, you have cash flow, you're, you're, even if you are the best intention person in the world, once you become an apartment building owner, you're now the bad guy. You're just, just, you're the bad guy. You're always the bad guy. You're now the bad guy because you're renting to tenants. You're the, you know, the one percenter who's taking their money, who's taking advantage of them. Everyone feels bad for the tenant. Everyone hates the landlord. You're now the bad guy. So just deal with that. Part of being the bad guy is um, things are going to happen with the multifamily building. And this is part of valuing the risk. And I want you to know about this going in so it's not a shock. Um, once you become an investor of a multifamily building, things are going to happen and you're expected to pay for it. Um, depending on the place where you live or where your, um, where your property is located at. Um, you may have to do village inspections. There may be code violations. There may be health violations. Um, there's things where if something should pop up, it becomes your problem. Even if it's not your problem, it's your problem. What does that mean? Um, if you move a tenant in and the tenant brings in bed bugs and the whole building now has bed bugs, it's not your problem. Um, you didn't bring the bed bugs in. It's not your fault. You're totally innocent. That tenant brought the bed bugs in, but it's your building. Now that there's bed bugs in the building, it's now your problem. And now you have to spend the money to fix it. Um, let's say uh, the HVAC has an issue, goes down, it's the middle of winter, and now it's freezing cold in the building. Your problem. Even if the tenant broke the thermostat, and now because the thermostat's broken, um, it doesn't know to heat the units, there's no heat going in the unit. Still your problem. Um, I can list off a hundred things like this. Everything is, and at the end of the day, everything is going to become your problem and you need to fix it. If you sit around and you argue and you go, woe is me, you're not going to get anywhere. You just need to deal with this stuff. It's going to pop up. Just deal with it. it you're an investor and weird things are going to happen. you got to roll with some of these punches. Um, some places where you have an investment property at, um, anytime your tenants throw trash out and they throw it in the dumpster and the lid to the dumpster is open, you get a ticket from the city. If they throw trash on the ground around the dumpster because the dumpster is full or they throw a, a couch in front of the dumpster, you're going to get a ticket from the city. Every time they put, you know, they take out their Christmas tree and their Christmas tree is on the back deck and the back deck's blocking where you can't get out. You're going to get a ticket from the city. Um, you can try to pass that along to the tenants. Good luck with that. You can make the attempt. Um, they're going to say it wasn't them. It wasn't their couch. It wasn't their tree. Whatever. You have to try to prove it. Um, at the end of the day, if you don't pay it, the city is going to hold you responsible. So you're responsible for everything that happens in that building. Even if the tenant does it, you're responsible for it. Just know that. Just know that, just know it, expect it, incorporate that in. I would just go ahead and incorporate in, you know, that there could be um, some thing you're gonna have to deal with with a village or an inspector or whatever case may be. You're just gonna have to roll with that. Just price that in, um, you know, like we're talking about, have some risk pricing in your yearly expenses. You know, you some people just call it miscellaneous. I call it risk. Um, stuff's gonna pop up. Just deal with it and, and know that going into it, that things like that are going to happen when you have income property, um, that things are going to pop up and you're just going to have to deal with it. No one's going to feel sorry for you.
So just just get over that part of it and move on. You're now a property investor. Everyone expects a property investor to have deep pockets and pay for stuff. So you know every time the city's running low on money, a bunch of tickets come in the mail, and I have to explain to clients that you know this is what happens. So you're gonna have to deal with it. Um, obviously, if it's not your fault, we try to um, get that stuff dismissed. A lot of times we do get stuff dismissed. We do get kind of you know bs stuff in the mail that they're just hoping that we're going to pay it um but more often than not we do end up paying stuff um let's check here we got tenant health issues we covered that um oh yeah if they bring rats in the building we didn't talk about rats if they bring rats in the building they're now your rats. You have to pay for dealing with that problem. Even if I had a debate with a guy this week, even if the tenant leaves garbage on the back deck and then has garbage in their kitchen, then the tenant comes up the back deck and is attracted by the garbage and then finds a way into the unit because they have garbage in the kitchen. You're still, it's still your fault. It's even though they basically had a trail of breadcrumbs literally into their unit it's still your fault that the rats in their unit because you own property now. So no matter what, it's going to be your fault. All right. Um, we talked about talking to agents. Please network like crazy. Get out there. Talk to commercial agents in your neighborhood. Um, introduce yourself to them. Face-to-face -face meetings are way better than phone calls. Try to um, meet with them. Get in front of them. Let them know that you're interested in being an investor in the neighborhood. Um, we talked about creating your own valuation for cap, depending on what neighborhood you're looking at, what asset class you're looking at. Meaning, are you looking at a six-unit building? Or are you looking at a 24-unit building? Um, the pricing could be different based on those different size buildings within even the same neighborhood. So know that. Um, uh, we talked about making sure it's cash flowing, about the risks with onboarding. We talked about um, pouring over the expenses and how important the attorney review is when you're buying these income properties. Um, we talked about the importance of doing a right, the right kind of inspection on an income property. Um, I think that's everything we're going to cover for today because I can't get into the rest of this without going into a whole other half hour discussion of diving in deeper on any of those individual topics. So that's the primer that's everything you need to know for the basics of buying your first multifamily property there's a lot more there's way 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 more that you need to know you need to way know a lot more about analyzing a particular neighborhood there's more you need to know about um how you really determine what your cap rate is versus what the seller's asking for the cap rate is um we need to get in a lot more about the actual hard factors about what is going on as far as um expenses with the property um government regulations that we're dealing with right now that um are making some um multifamily investment a little more difficult um multifamily housing is still a fantastic way to go but when we're dealing with some of those external factors like government regulation again we need to price that stuff in um knowing about the latest news that's going on with that. Um, it, you know, I could do a whole thing talking about networking with the agents and what you need to know when you talk to them. It's very important. Um, knowing what asset class, knowing do you want a six unit building, do you want an 18 unit building, do you want um, a 48 unit building? Um, those are all very different from each other. Um, also the different neighborhood you're looking in may determine what you're willing to do. A six unit building in one neighborhood may take the same amount of time and management as a 24 unit in a completely different neighborhood because if you're dealing with and, and that's part of the attractiveness with some people to do an a plus neighborhood because when you're in an a plus neighborhood um it should need a lot less time it should need a lot less um, maintenance versus when you're in like those C neighborhoods sometimes those buildings need a lot of a lot of attention um, and, and you need to be there a lot more often or your property manager needs to be a lot more often which is going to raise your expenses if your property manager has to keep going to that building all the time so knowing all that you're going to have to do a lot of research on this um, we sit down with people we usually help them kind of funnel them into which of those areas that they need which of those type of asset classes they need and then help them determine okay 
here's where you need to focus on, this is the area you need to focus on, this is the type of building you need to focus on, and this is really where on the cap rate you probably want to be at and kind of give them a little guidance with that and let them run with it. Um, what, the last thing I'll leave this with, and then and then we'll wrap this one up for now, um, and we'll come back to it a later date. But for now, I'm, I've been getting, fielding a lot of um, attention of people saying that either multifamily is bad right now or, or particular areas are bad right now and they don't want to buy anything. Um, everyone's ready for something to happen with the economy. That's kind of like the big worry right now. Everyone's worried something's going to happen with the economy. Um, I'll tell you what I tell all of my clients. So you're getting the same stuff I tell my individual clients. Multifamily is intended to be a long-term investment. It's not a flip. It's not a short-term thing. So if you're buying an 18-unit or even a 6-unit apartment building, you're intending, should be, intending to buy that building and own it for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Now, you may have a shorter exit plan. You know, sometimes people say, you know, it's an up-and-coming neighborhood where I can create value. So we're going to buy it and hold it for maybe about five, and then I'll probably sell it or something like that. Um, and we occasionally get the apartment building flippers, but not many. Most times people want to buy an apartment building because they want to keep it. Most people sell buy apartment buildings and just never want to sell them um, unless they get a really, really good offer, which does happen sometimes too. And, you know, we welcome that. But if the economy, let's say worst case scenario in 2020, yes, the economy tanks for whatever reason. Um, if you bought an asset and you place the value upon the risk properly like I'm talking about and you've done your research and you've made a smart buy, you haven't overpaid for the property, you haven't overpaid based on, on the environmental conditions for this where the property is located at, you've done everything the right way. Even if the economy tanks, it doesn't affect you. It doesn't affect your property. Yes, the, the, the stuff around you might be selling for less, but your value for your building is determined by the rental performance. If you're building, if you if you got it for a good price and you believe that even if the economy were to pull back, that you still will get the same rental performance and maybe even just a little bit less rental performance in the building and it's still cash flows, then I don't really see what the issue is. Um, if you get hung up on what every other building is selling for in a neighborhood, you're going to drive yourself crazy. Um, the value of your income property is reflective of how much money it's bringing in. You're using the income appraised value of an apartment building. Um, so if your apartment building, you buy it for a million, and the one across the street from you that's the exact same building, um, they start mismanaging it or the owner loses all their money in the stock market because the stock market, you know, tanked and, you know, they had a nervous breakdown. They stopped taking care of the building. So none of the tenants are paying rent and the building goes, you know, down the tubes and now they, they it either gets foreclosed on or the seller says, screw it, I just need to sell this thing and get out of here and get what little cash I have and go do something else with my life. So I'll sell it for, you know, 500,000. So now you're thinking, well, now I'm screwed. Oh my God, I paid a million for mine and the guy across the street selling his for five. We don't use comps for apartment buildings. We use income to determine the value. So if your building is cash flowing and netting you, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year. So it's a, well, it would be for easy numbers. Let's just stick with the 10 cap. It wouldn't be a 10 cap. Well, let's, let's use it for easy numbers. Let's say it's cash flowing a hundred thousand a year at a 10 cap and you paid a million dollars for it. So the one across the street from you, um, you know, sold for 500. You're thinking, well, that means my building's worth 500,000. Well, no, you're still cash flowing. You're still worth a million dollars. Your, your value didn't go down because the one across the street from you sold for less. You still have the income. As long as you have the income, your building's still worth what it's worth. The reason the one across from you sold for 500,000 is because it didn't have income. See, if the income goes down, then the property goes down. But just because they're sold for that, that doesn't mean that's what your building is now worth. We're not running comps. We're running comps based on cap and valuation. When we run comps on a building, you'll, you'll see price per square footage. A lot of people use price per square footage, which is fine. Um, uh, I, I don't mind people using that. Um, I like, But I like to use cap. 
So if your cap rate on your property is that you're reaching a certain value, um, it, the one across the street that's not bringing in any income, I don't care. I don't care about that. So I don't want you guys obsessed with this idea of, well, the market goes down and the prices go down, that's going to affect my building. As long as you feel comfortable that you can keep the rental pool, that you're not going to have to deal with higher evictions, that you can keep the rent fairly stabilized, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to you. Um, you just want to get the good value. Now, I will say, if you really do believe that the market is going to tank this year and there will be those opportunities, maybe you do want to keep um, a little bit of cash in reserve so if you do see an opportunity, you can jump on it and make an aggressive buy. But I don't want you, the same thing in real estate applies to the stock market. You'll hear stock market guys talk about this a lot. You will drive yourself crazy trying to time the market. And if you spend all of your time trying to time the market, usually if you do that, you miss the market. So if you're sitting on the sidelines constantly waiting to time it, usually by the time you realize what has happened, it, you missed it. You missed the boat. So if you always have your money on the sidelines and you're not in the game, by the time you realize what's going on, you've missed either running up or running down or whatever may happen. Um, so I, I don't want you constantly waiting for, oh, I'm going to wait until the market goes down. Well, how are you going to know that when it happens? And how are you going to know when it hits the bottom? Because that's usually what happens. You can, you can determine when it's going down. But the risk you run into is you're constantly waiting for it to go down and you're trying to predict the bottom. And by the time you figure out what the bottom is, the only, the only way you figure out what the bottom is, is after it's already bounced back up. So it's gone, the values have gone down and you're waiting, oh, I'm going to wait for it to go down more. I'm going to wait for it to go down more. And now the values have shot back up and you're like, oh, well, I guess that was the bottom. So that's the danger with timing. Um, so I don't want you constantly obsessed with this whole idea of, well, I'm going to wait for the economy to go down because I think that there's going to be a, a pullback or a bubble or whatever the case may be. Um, yes, there's overpriced stuff on the market, um, but there's a lot of other stuff that's out there too. There's always going to be opportunities that are out there. I want you to be out there. If you're serious about getting involved with in 2020, getting involved with multifamily investing, I want you out there. I want you talking to people. I want you networking. I want you prepared. I want you ready to go and be ready to get involved with the market and you will find good opportunities. And if things do start to happen where maybe the economy starts to go backwards a little bit or, or whatever the case may be, um, I, I don't want everyone thinking that we're going to run for the hills. Um, yeah. Yes, when the economy goes bad um, or when prices go down is a time when a lot of investors start buying stuff like crazy, for sure. There's no doubt about that. But even when the market's at its high, they're still buying opportunities. There's, there is, is, I don't want everyone to stop this whole idea of, um, you know, we're, we're waiting for it. I don't, want, I don't want you waiting to the point that 10 years goes by and you're still waiting for it because... There are people like that that talked 10 years ago about buying real estate and this whole decade went by and they're still waiting for their opportunity. If you're not in the game, that you're not going to get um, anywhere with this. You're not going to accumulate any assets. You're not going to um, create any wealth. Um, you, there's always going to be buying opportunities out there for you. So don't be afraid. Get in there. Get in the game. Stop trying to time the market and make good, aggressive purchases. Find those buildings where the owner wants to retire. Find those buildings where it's being horribly mismanaged by a really bad management company and the seller just wants to get out while they still have some value in the building. So now you have an opportunity to go in there and create value. If you can buy a building for a million dollars and you know you can lower expenses and you can do things so that um, that building that was making a net of a hundred thousand dollars a year and you can turn that into $120,000 or $130,000 a year by doing some stuff to the building, increasing some, you know, um, reducing the utilities by replacing some of the, um, like the boiler and things like that in the building, or maybe replacing windows or a roof so it's more um, fuel efficient, or, or getting a better property manager that isn't running through all the money in the building, or doing any number of those things. 
if you take you know think so let's take that billing again that we're going off the 10 caps we're keeping easy numbers here the billings netting a hundred thousand and and it has um, and we're going off a 10 cap and it's worth a million so let's say you reduce the expenses and now the net for that billing has now shot up to um, a hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year if you take that 10 cap that building now appraises up for 1.3 million you've created three hundred thousand dollars of equity by eliminating um, maybe redundancies in the expenses streamlining the management or the efficiency of the building and maybe making it more fuel efficient so you reduce the utilities um, th that's how you create value in these properties so it doesn't in the same building if that building cross street sells for five hundred thousand because the seller gets frustrated and needs to get out of there um, your building is still worth 1.3 million uh, it because it's income flowing so just keep that in mind remember to think of this as in terms of numbers um, this, these are not houses where the comp is going to destroy your building um, I see buildings all the time where a building will sell for three million dollars and the building kitty corner from it sells for seven hundred thousand it doesn't matter it doesn't matter because as long as they're income flowing the one doesn't reflect the other each individual building is its own is its own situation so just remember that just remember don't get don't get hung up on that I see people get hung up on that um, and it, it it makes you I feel like it confuses people it makes them distraught and then they don't end up buying anything and they miss out so I want I want you guys to get in the game and I want you guys to um, if you're really serious about getting involved with multifamily about buying your own apartment building um, just know that know the, know those factors um, if you have any questions if there's anything that I skipped over that you would like to know a little bit more about please Please comment below let me know um, and I will see you guys tomorrow for what was tomorrow tomorrow we're gonna go more into the property inspection issue for multi for all investment properties we're gonna do a deep dive just on inspection issues day after that will be what's tomorrow Monday we're gonna do inspections Tuesday will be hard money lenders we're gonna talk about um, doing stuff with hard money lenders um, evaluating them communicating with them important things you need to know I love using hard money but it's very important things you need to know about when you're deploying hard money so you don't find yourself in a bad position Wednesday will be private money and private investors this is one of the hot issues that we get people always want to know how do I get a private investor we're going to talk about that on Wednesday uh, we're going to give you some hard truths about what you need to know about having a private investor on your property Thursday will be um, JV joint venture agreements and partnerships we're going to do a deep dive on that about um, you know I do putting together partnerships almost every day in the office what are things that I see that you need to know and then finally Friday we're going to talk about um, recreational marijuana and real estate the state of Illinois just uh, made as of January 1st recreational marijuana is now legal in Illinois what do you need to know about that in real estate as far as property management um, as far as uh, anything with real estate as far, you know if you're an agent anything you need to know about recreational marijuana in real estate we're going to cover that and then Saturday January 11th will be the um, US Bank multifamily um, investor summit we're going to do a deep we're going to do a panel there about recreational marijuana and real estate it's a big issue obviously it just became legal five days ago so everyone wants to know about what they can and can't do with their property um, we're going to do a deep dive on that at the we're going to do a panel there but first we're going to talk about it on Friday um, now we'll complete the 10 days but after that if there's videos you want me to do please let me know um, I already have a bunch kind of scripted out but I'm always willing to sidetrack if there's a lot of people that have a particular topic they feel that they need to know about um, that's it for today have a great Sunday and I will talk to you soon